All right. Um, hi, everybody. Hope you can hear me uh, online and everything. Uh, if you can't, please send a message or something. Um, so I'm Kyle. I am at UT Austin, uh, PhD student. I'm working with Paolo Pasolacqua. So we, we've been, you know, part of this project for a couple of years now working on <clears throat> sort of the modeling component and trying to bridge the, the gap between the in-situ data that you've seen a lot of and then the remote sensing information that you've seen a lot of. Um, <clears throat> and so we've been, we've been using this, these you know, very cool data sets since the pre Delta X campaign. So it's been uh, really fun to figure out how to learn how to, you know, tailor your model to using this kind of information. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about the model that we've been using, which is called the NUGA. Um, I imagine that many of you are probably not very familiar with this model. Uh, many of you are probably coming from, from HECRAS or from Dell 3D. Um, this model has a lot of commonalities with those, so a lot of your sort of modeling know-how will carry over. Uh, but I do want to, to introduce you to, to this model that I think is, is pretty cool. Um, so just, yeah. So just a brief overview. Um, so I'm going to introduce you guys to the Anuga software. And then I'm going to dive into some attributes of the Atchafalaya domain that um, I know many of you are probably familiar with and that obviously you've seen a lot of sort of information about so far. Uh, but I kind of want to talk about it at more of a process level. So what kind of um, environmental conditions and stuff are really important for our model to be able to capture in this landscape um, because that information informs the approach that we've used in trying to build our model. Um, and then I'll go into some of the inputs and stuff in this presentation, so some of the background things that, uh, you know, I can show you before we actually start, you know, playing around with the code. Um, and then we, I have a run through where we will build not exactly the same model that we've been developing for the Delta X campaign because um, it's, it's a bit large. So uh, we've simplified it a little bit and uh, reduced the, the scale to make it into something that you can actually play around with on, on your machine. Um, and then I'll come back to the to the slides to show some of the cooler model outputs and things that you can do with this that, um, you know, your simulations will not be long enough for anything to see any of that cool stuff. So uh, I'll just come back. Um, briefly, I do want to say, uh, I, I kind of want to tie in what I'm going to be talking about into where it falls in this sort of broad Delta X picture that you've been looking at. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces in this project. And the way that I kind of imagine the, the place of this model in, in the framework is that uh, all of the in situ data and uh, remote sensing data that you've been seeing for these water based observables, we're trying to tie those things together, both at the small and large scale, to sort of fill in the temporal information and these sort of mid range uh, sort of process level descriptions about what's happening in the landscape as discharge changes, as tides move in and out of the system, uh, as wind fronts come, come in and out. Um, and this, these models are working with uh, sediment transport and ecology components to uh, try to make, you know, uh, combined predictions about what the geomorphology is going to do in response to these things. Um, but also just the, the, the water model that I am concerned with, we're, we're using sort of independently of that to answer questions about uh, residence times, fluxes between different areas of the landscape. Um, so that is sort of where this, where this falls into what you seen already. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction to Anuga. Um, so some of the advantages of Anuga and the, and the things that drew us to it are that it is a free and open source model. Um, and when I say open source, I mean like kind of rigidly open source, like it's very easy to access and install. Uh, well, as easy as anything on Python is to uh, access and install, which can still still be tricky. Um, but it is very well developed and, and it's you know, developed by a whole community. So there's nothing about it that's really oriented around trying to make money. It is just a tool for doing science. Um, the actual code of Anuga is written in uh, Python, um, which is a very you know, user-friendly language. It's very popular. Most, most people nowadays are learning how to use it. Um, the computationally expensive parts of the model are written in C. So the, the pieces that you don't normally have to interface with are written in a, in a faster language so that um, the model isn't, you know, limited to being the speed of Python, which isn't necessarily the fastest. Um, but all of the pieces of the model that you could want to play around with or improve or edit are very easy to do so. So 
Um, if you're coming from something like Delft 3D, it, it can be a lot harder to uh, sort of know what the internals of that model are doing at any given time. Um, whereas in this in this model, you can really easy, easily open the relevant scripts and just you know find the relevant lines of code and change them if you need to, um, which can be very helpful if you're if you're trying to build up tools uh, that are playing around with data types that haven't existed before. Um, so the model uses a flexible unstructured mesh. So it's a non-Cartesian grid. It uses uh, triangles that you can uh, easily spatially refine. So you can have high resolution in certain places, low resolution elsewhere. So you can sort of prioritize your computations where you most need it. Um, and the, the model itself is an Australian model. Uh, it was developed for coastal flooding like tsunamis and, and dam breaks. Um, so it is, it's sort of well tailored to coastal applications and uh, just sort of numerically, it has a few, a few advantages that I don't know a whole lot of details about, but uh, apparently has very stable treatment of sort of wetting and drying, which is uh, obviously important in like a tidal landscape where you have places that are not just constantly inundated. Um, so some of the default features that are included in a NUGA or uh, at least things that are very easy to implement are changes in inflows, so discharge, uh, tidal conditions. Um, it has operators that can handle wind or rainfall. Um, it's very easy to refine the mesh using sort of just, uh, you, you know, you can define regions with polygons or however you want to, um, to, to change the re resolution spatially. Uh, it comes built in with Manning's friction uh, parameterized and the model is uh, fully parallel Compatible. So if you have a machine uh, that has, you know, MPI capabilities, you can take a very large model and break it up into some smaller chunks that can then run uh, in parallel, which can significantly speed up your, your speed and, uh, you know, the, reduce the amount of time it takes to get, get results. Um, some features that are not built into Anuga, but that we have added uh, over the last few years as we, you know, have played around with this project, uh, we've added more... Uh, uh, sophisticated friction operators, such as the, the Baptiste equation. So if you have ever modeled um, sort of vegetated zones or marsh, uh, marshy areas, this is a, a common parameterization that you might use. Um, it, it's one that's also available in, in Delft. Um, we've developed some pre-processing algorithms to take sort of remote sensing imagery and uh, use it to sort of uh, sophisticatedly uh, refine your mesh to, to capture the features that you might be interested in. Um, and then we've added some models that we, we use on top of Anuga results, um, such as some Lagrang Lagrangian particle tracking uh, and some sediment transport operators that our colleagues at Caltech have been working on. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of these things as I move through. Um, so if you're coming here with you know model knowledge, uh, it's just some brief under the hood descriptions. Um, Anuga uses a finite volume method uh, and it uses it on this sort of unstructured triangular grid. So in this photo, which comes from the Anuga user manual, you can imagine that you have these cells and it computes the fluxes between uh, all of these uh, triangular uh, uh, grid cells. So um, it's just doing a little mass balance on all of these, these uh, elements. Um, and, you know, coming from sort of a Cartesian setting, it, it can be a lot more um, convoluted to imagine how to interface with a, with a data format like this. So um, that, was, that was one thing that took me some time when moving from the structured to unstructured realm was learning how to uh, think about things in this sort of triangular context. Um, and the model solves the, the fully 2D depth average uh, shallow water equation. So uh, you know, two momentum and one conservation equation. Uh, so you get the full physical picture of, you know, tides at the, at the scale that it's, it's relevant to, to describe those processes. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the Atchafalaya domain at sort of the functional level of, of how the landscape works. Um, so you'll remember from the earlier uh, presentations, and if, if you're familiar with this landscape, you already know, this is the ag actively aggradational uh, region of the of the Delta X like focus sites. Um, so this is a place that has been building land that we really want to understand how how these processes work, where sediment is moving, where vegetation is is building and accreting uh, uh, elevation. Um, and so some 
features of the landscape that I think are important to, to think about um, is that these, these river deltas are discharge dominated systems. So it really is these large fluxes from upstream that are, that are driving most of the uh, processes in the, in the landscape, as opposed to um, some other deltas around, around the world and also over in like the marshy areas of Terrebonne where, where tides and winds are, are kind of the dominant uh, processes. Um, the tides are still important, so there's a tidal amplitude of about 30 centimeters. Um, and there's a really big range of scales that are, that are important in the landscape and that present a challenge in modeling. So the channel widths that we expect to be delivering, you know, important uh, fluxes around the landscape uh, range from uh, about three orders of magnitude in, in their channel width. Um, and so you can imagine that if you want to capture uh, all of these channels with your with your model mesh, you, you're really limited by the smallest feature that you want to be able to capture. If you're if you're using like a Cartesian grid where all of your grid cells are the same size, then the smallest elements that you uh, you know want to want to capture in your landscape, that's your grid size. And as a result, your model uh, file sizes and simulation times can be really enormous. Um, so that is one of the reasons that we are uh, implementing this unstructured approach is that we can tailor that spatially to where we, where we actually need to prioritize our computations. Um, that, that being said, the channels are not the only things that are really dynamic in the system. So there is a lot of uh, exchange with the, with the adjacent wetlands um, that kind of varies depending on the sort of antecedent topography of the area. Um, there are some distinct vegetation zones by elevation, so there's a lot of uh, clustering that uh, occurs in sort of different elevation ranges, which is a feature that we took advantage of in how we parameterize friction. Um, so we have sort of individual classes that we've clustered in the same way that the, the broader Delta X campaign does um, that allow us to sort of reduce our, our parameter space and, and simplify the, the process of like calibration. Um, and then there's this very seasonal phase between when there are floods in the system and when the vegetation is, uh, you know, full and emergent, um, which goes back to the, the, the broader Delta X idea of having the spring and fall campaign. So we have the high discharge, low vegetation scenario and the uh, low discharge, high vegetation scenario. And we basically have the same model that we have, you know, tuned our, our coefficients and all of our uh, parameters to uh, apply in each of those individual scenarios. So um, that's kind of the, the focus is that we have uh, distinct fall and spring settings that we use. Um, so some features of the model design itself, uh, we wanted to be able to capture uh, the wax lake and Atchafalaya system uh, at, at like a macro scale. And these are two deltas that are very connected together. Um, so we, we, we needed quite a large domain that we could close the mass balance on, so to speak. Um, so what we did is we de designed a model that basically follows the perimeter of all of these uh, emergent like levees and flood protection structures in the system um, at places where it's convenient to close the mass balance. So you can see these levees in the, in the picture on the right. And the, the model boundary that I'll show in a little bit is basically just on the outside of those where we are confident that fluxes are not moving through those regions. And then at each of the major junctions in the Wax Lake outlet and the Morgan City outlet, um, and then some, some outlets on the uh, intercoastal waterway, we have gauges or other information that we can use to, to close that mass balance along with uh, tidal information out in the bay. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what those boundary conditions look like in a minute. Um, and then we internally inside of this model, this is, uh, in order to get a, a model that can enclose that much area, um, we would need a, a really large model if we were modeling it with a uniform mesh resolution. Um, and so we, we've, uh, implemented some pre-processing algorithms to kind of optimize where that, where that goes. Um, and then inside of the model, we have all of these interior gauges from CRIM sites, NOAA gauges, USGS gauges. Uh, as well as in-situ gauges that we installed during the campaign. Um, and then all of this remote sensing information in the wetlands or in the channels uh, from UABSAR or from AirSWAT um, that we try to fit the model to in various ways. Um, and so there's, there's a really almost ridiculous amount of calibration information that you can, you can play around with. 
Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the uh, mesh design. So we're not going to get into this in the collab, but I did want to uh, maybe just show what that looked like. And what we did is we developed this uh, basically pre-processing tool that can take uh, remote sensing information and convert uh, sort of the intuitive understanding of what features in the landscape you want to capture in your model into the kinds of data that Anuga requires to refine your mesh spatially. Um, and the, the model that we're, we're using right now was uh, constructed around a, uh, the pre-Delta X campaign um, that we're still you know, updating and refining for the, as new data comes in with the actual Delta X campaign. Um, and so what this looked like in, in this application is we took some long-term time series of optical data from, from Planet Labs that, extra, that we extracted um, basically water presence, uh, some sort of proxies from NDBI for where wetlands are very dynamic, um, as well as some UAV SAR data uh, that tells us on a short time scale where, where the tidal activity was. Um, and we used that to say, these are the areas where we expect a lot of dynamic activity in our model. Uh, we want our model to perform well in these locations because this is what's really driving the system process. Um, and then in the other regions that appear to be relatively inactive, we can reduce our mesh resolution or just, you know, less prioritize those regions computationally uh, because even if there are things happening there, uh, it doesn't appear that our model is going to have a whole lot to say about, about those processes. Um, and so what that looks like is basically this image processing uh, algorithm that takes this binary mask that can really represent any kind of remote sensing information you have. Uh, in this case, it was those masks from the previous slide, but, uh, you know, it, we can update it with new adverse information or anything else that comes out. Um, and it basically steps through a couple uh, uh, processes that convert that into the kind of polygon information that a NUGA requires, which basically just means closed objects that don't have any like crossing lines or uh, things that would cause the, the built-in mesh algorithm to not perform well. Um, and on the right, you can just see what that output looks like in this small section of the domain where you have uh, quite a lot of mesh elements in the channels and in the places that are, that are active from this image, and you have fewer uh, mesh cells in the, in the other areas. Um, and so all of this is to say that we, you know, apply this over the whole, you know, model domain, and we have this collection of interior polygons in which we uh, sort of deprioritize computations so that we can uh, ramp up the resolution in other places. Um, and these will, these will uh, be in the, the model implementation today. Um, so we, we will be coarsening the model in the, in the you know, collab that you'll get to play around with, but just to show you what the full scale model looks like, um, on the left you can see the uh, mesh resolution in the model where these dark blue areas are the places where the cells are, are very small and we should get, you know, really good uh, uh, dynamics in, in, in how the water is flowing. Um, and you can see that it kind of follows the, the channel network of the system, which is what we want. And then on the right, you can see what the, the resulting topography looks like once we uh, add in the bathymetry information that we, we've also gathered as, as part of Delta X. Um, so getting into the details of the boundary conditions, we have in this, in this area, we have two major inlets at the Calumet gauge and the uh, USGS Morgan City gauge. Um, so those provide most of the water inflow from upstream. Um, in this area, the uh, Gulf Intercoastal Waterway typically flows out of this, of this uh, area on both sides. And so we have two smaller outlets, um, one over here at USGS uh, Franklin, um, which up until 2019 provided discharge information, uh, but lately is only uh, water level. And so we have a if, if, it, if we're modeling a time period before 2019, we just grab the discharge directly from the gauge. And if it's uh, after 2019, we have basically a rating curve that takes the water level and converts it back to what the discharge probably is. Um, over on the other side at Avoca Pass, um, there, there is not a discharge gauge, but there are uh, historical measurements of, of discharge at that location. And so we have a basically a monthly average for all of the historical record of those ADCP transects that we just pull the relevant month and say that that's approximately the outlet. 
Um, these, are, these are both much smaller than the input discharge, so most of that mass is staying inside of the system. Uh, but we're basically just trying to make sure we get the mass balance as accurately as we can. And then out in the bay, we uh, pull tidal information from one of two NOAA gauges, so either the Emerita Pass gauge over here in Atchafalaya or the Eugene gauge out, out, at, uh, out in the bay. Um, which one we pull from basically just depends on the quality of the data at that time. Sometimes one or more are not available. Um, but you can, there's a simple setting where you can choose that in, in the model. Um, and then in the roughness parameterization, um, so we use a classification map to do this, and this is basically a living document, so we're improving this as we get more and more uh, data and information. Right now, we have six uh, roughness classes that we include in the model. Three of these are open water classes that correspond to the open ocean, large channels, and small channels. Um, and for that, we use Manning's roughness, just a classic approach with just some typical uh, coefficients. Um, and then in the uh, three vegetation zones that I mentioned before, uh, we use the Baptiste equation, which is a little more convoluted. Um, but these, this equation uses things that we uh, have observations as part of Delta X uh, on the vegetation structure itself that we can use to um, improve the roughness in these places like vegetation density, diameter, and vegetation height. Um, so it fits very well with, with the uh, you know, observables that we've collected. Um, so all of that being said, that I think that's all of the necessary background. What we can do now is go ahead and run to the code itself. Um, so if you can go to this uh, GitHub page, um, which is right here, this is going to be the, the relevant collab for this, this uh, session. And I'll, I'll wait a second for people to maybe type that out. Um, and if you already do have it open, you're just like the other previous sessions, you're going to click on this opening collab button. Um, the only difference with this collab is that we're not going to connect this to Google Drive. We're just going to pull all of the codes directly from this GitHub uh, page. So if you actually want to, um, the full scale model as it currently exists is available in this in this folder. So it is, uh, you know, directly modifiable. You can play around with the settings themselves. Um, so even though we're building a core scale model in our collab today. Uh, all of those other modeling files are also available that you can you can directly use. Hey, Kyle, um, we see just your presentation. Oh, I and same with online. Yeah, I, thought I was sharing the screen. Sorry about that. Oh, is there a screen too? Is this the is this the collab? Oh, still. So the online sees the collab, but okay. the projector is still the PowerPoint. Okay, now the projector is the collab, but online is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've tried every other iteration, so surely this one will be the correct. Yes. Both? E, uh, yeah, that looks good. Um, maybe you want to minimize the, <laughs> yes. the videos. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you have this collab open, go ahead and um, connect to a session. And there's, there's some description here that you can read um, that describes, you know, collab and other attributes. Um, so what we're going to do in order to get the files running on this on this collab is we're actually going to clone the GitHub net, uh, notebook that you you know just clicked from. Um, if you are trying to run this locally, uh, I have no I had no intention that uh, it would necessarily work. I didn't expect the uh, you know installs to go go smoothly for anybody, so I tried to make sure that it would work in collab. Um, so if you are trying to run this locally, uh, the only thing you'll need to do is clone the notebook. Uh, and run this command. Uh, so in, if you're familiar with installing Python packages, this is you know pretty typical, but um, this is the only command you need to keep if you're not doing this in collab. Um,
and this should just take a moment. So what this is doing is it's just installing um, all of the things that you don't already have in your in your collab environment, um, such as Anuga and the the relevant model files for for this workshop. Not sure why that's not printing out text, but it appears to be running. It should be printing out text. As this code block progresses, if you want to uh, see what it's doing, you can click on this file button on the on the left sidebar, and you should see some of these repositories uh, showing up in your uh, notebook like uh, file system. How is this going on everyone else's? Is this is it printing out like okay, downloading pip files and stuff like that? Good. I'll rely on y'all's text output since mine is quiet. But files are showing up, uh -oh. so it appears things are working. That one should take. Yeah, maybe about 50 seconds ish. Maybe it's longer. I don't know. That was the slowest one for me. Okay. There we go. Okay. And after that runs, everything should be working. Um, and all we have to do is import our packages. So, um, most of these are the ones you've already seen. And then in addition to those, we're, we're also importing a NUGA and a few specific pieces of a NUGA that it's just kind of convenient to have uh, shorthand uh, names for, such as some plotting functions and some um, uh, operators that do, do specific things. Um, so in the underlying uh, actual model implementation, there's sort of a, a structure of the code that's broken up into a few separate scripts. Um, one of those scripts is just a settings file where you can change your settings directly for like the period you want to run, what gauges you're pulling from, um, what your friction coefficients are. That's all kind of collected into one neat little file that you can neatly change so you can, you know, re run repeated simulations. Um, and all of your other scripts inherit that information from the settings file. Um, and then you have a few other uh, functions for, for just kind of some background tools that just kind of helpfully wrap things together into a neat little package so that your, your code is nice and readable. Um, what we're going to do in this uh, implementation is uh, we're, we're basically going to write over the run scripts. So uh, we're going to ignore um, these underlying Python scripts and we're just going to build the model from scratch here in Colab. Um, and we've got some crosswalks. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this will be a simplified model compared to what the real one looks like, but um, it'll show you all of the uh, steps that go into building an Anuga model that uh, even outside of the context of this, you know, Atchafalaya domain, you could apply to whatever landscape you're trying to build. So the same workflow uh, applies to, to whatever you're, you're working on. Um, and so we're going to import some of those underlying functions from our uh, GitHub. Uh, here and then we're we're just going to move into our uh, Anuga uh, folder so that we know where everything is and keep everything nice and nice and simple. Um, so the first thing that we do in this model implementation is we are going to build our domain and our mesh. So basically, we're just supplying our model with some geometry of our system. Um, 
And you can think of this kind of, it, it, this is a typical Python object that we're just gonna add attributes to later. So um, you can think of this as just a container that we're gonna start adding data pieces to until it's a model that is capable of running. Um, so what, the, what that looks like um, is the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load in our model bounding geometry. So we're just gonna tell it, it with a polygon that's sort of pre-saved already into your, into your files. Um, where the outline of this of this model is in space, um, and we're gonna you know name a few of those tags, uh, name a few of those boundary elements. Um, so this is just a list of uh, which uh, indices correspond to which segments of that boundary, um, and then we're gonna load in all of our internal polygons that, as I mentioned before, came from this remote sensing information that we uh, have pre-processed. Um, so this is where the major difference is going to be between this model in Colab and the actual model is that we are going to um, make two relevant changes. The first one is that we're going to reduce the background resolution of our model. Um, normally we aim to have a uh, max triangle size of about 25 by 25 meters, so about a 25 meter, meter grid resolution. Um, and we're going to reduce that in this implementation to uh, something much coarser, something about 100 by 100, uh, just to, you know, uh, reduce the number of elements. Um, and then the other change that we're going to make is that, uh, as I showed in the, in the mesh in the presentation, I should zoom in a little. Um, as I showed in the mesh in the presentation, we still have cells inside of our uh, sort of inactive mesh polygons that we're, we have in, inside of our domain. Uh, and the big change that I'm gonna make for this uh, application is I'm just gonna say that these are completely inactive regions. We're gonna assume that there's no fluxes in and out of them and that it, they are just you know, holes inside of our domain where nothing is happening. So instead of being coarse, there's just not gonna be any, any cells inside of those areas. So um, this is all to just reduce the, the, file, the file size and, and simplify our, our uh, model a little bit. Uh, and then we're just gonna define some georeference information and with all of that, that is basically all of the geometry inputs that our model needs to be constructed. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna call this function create domains from region, domain from regions, um, that takes all of this information and creates this uh, domain object in Anuga that has all of our model attributes that we're, we're interested in. Um, I guess I zoomed in too soon. Nope. So you'll probably see it a little bit better on your own screens, but uh, we've printed out what that mesh looks like. Um, and we, we've also added a few extra settings. Um, and so what you can see here is sort of the vague outline of the Atchafalaya uh, watershed that I showed you before. You can kind of see where the, where the Wax Lake Delta is and where the uh, Atchafalaya Delta is, um, as well as most of the channels in the, in the network. Um, and then you can see that we have these holes in sort of in between uh, in these wetland areas that uh, for this model, we're just assuming are sort of empty areas that don't have a lot of uh, water. Um, you know, that's not a very accurate assumption, but it's fine for building a toy model. Um, and so you can see how this mesh resolution varies spatially. And all we actually had to tell this model was uh, what resolutions we wanted in each of those areas. So um, it, was, it was actually very simple to build this and the, the mesh itself just is pre-computed from the Anuga mesh engine. So if you supply the same inputs, you will get the same mesh every time um, and you, know, you get all of this spatial complexity without uh, having to do a whole lot of work. Um, so our mesh and our domain are now built and all we need to do are add attributes to it um, we can print out some statistics of our domain to see what our, uh, what our mesh looks like. So um, the number of triangles should be about 104,000. Um, and then it tells you some information kind of in the form of a histogram about what the typical uh, areas are inside of those triangles, um, what the ranges are on those, on those uh, triangles. So you can sort of read into the details and uh, get, some, get some information about what this mesh looks like. But we're gonna go ahead and move into the uh, adding data portion of, of this. Um, so this next cell should also take a minute to run. Uh, the only 
uh, thing that was not contained in the GitHub repository that we need is the underlying bathymetry, which is a uh, somewhat large file. Um, and so we, I'm going to pull it from a uh, uh, box repository that I that, that I already had it saved on. Uh, we're just going to download it and and uh, do some transformations. Um, so this I think should take about thirty seconds. While I'm waiting, are there any questions so far? Sure. It's just a general question. Um, on your bathymetry data, I don't know if you're aware or, or used as, um, the bathymetry data that was collected pretty recently by CPRA in that region, or if you might be interested, if we could point you to that. We are always interested in bathymetry data. Um, so the bathymetry was constructed by Michael, uh, who you've already uh, heard from, um, but it is it it pulls from a bunch of different sources, so it, that might be included in the the data. But I don't know. Yeah, no? I yes. and this is this is pretty recent data, and it's it's pretty high resolution. So hmm. um, we'll we'll point you to that. It's okay. in the bays and just on the, in the shallow offshore. So I think it could be very valuable. That sounds very interesting. Yes. Um, yeah. The the one that Michael made is from many years ago. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the, this is Mark, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure who was speaking, but we are definitely interested. So if you can please send the information along. Uh, we are actually computing a new DM for the entire region, so uh, we, we can stitch that also. Okay, great. Mark, this is Angelina, so I'll, um, okay. I'll make sure Perfect. you all get it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool. Um, so if, you're, if your box with the download has already finished running, go ahead and click run on this next cell while I describe it, because this one takes a minute. Um, so what we're going to do with this uh, bathymetry data set, which um, we're starting with it in the form of, a, uh, of an Esri ASCII file. Um, this was basically converted from, from a GeoTIFF because ASCII is something that Anuga likes. Um, so it's just, it's just file conversions to, to get it into a format that the, the code can handle in a nice, simple way. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this ASCII file that contains our bathymetry information, it's just a big raster, um, and we're going to convert it into a what's called a net CDF file, which is uh, just a convenient way to, to store large data um, that's, that has the extension of DEM using some of these pre-compiled uh, conversion functions that come prepackaged in Anuga. Um, and then we're going to convert it again into something called a points file. Um, and I don't actually know the details of what the points file is. Uh, the only thing that matters is that uh, it allows you to easily just add it to your domain uh, with all of the interpolation and stuff that you would want to do uh, just contained within, within the simple file transformation. Um, and then, you know, the last step of this, like, multi-conversion process is we're just going to populate each of our mesh cells with the underlying bathymetry. Um, and so this sets the elevation of, of all of our uh, underlying cells. Um, so you can see in the, in the printout that it's, uh, you know, doing these conversions and it's telling you basically how far along in the process it is. Um, and most of these are, are uh, n like non-destructive transformations. So you're not really losing information. You're just getting it into the file format that it prefers. Um, there are other ways to, you know, interpolate it onto the mesh if you if you wanted to. Uh, but this applies some like smoothing operators and stuff and make sure that the the underlying triangles get all of the information contained inside of a, each of those cells. Um, and so we're just, you know, saying that at the centroid of each of our each of our cells, we're we're uh, adding this this topography elevation. Um, and about, I don't know, a third of the way through through that process. Um, so if there are any other questions, it is it is a good time. Yes. Just, uh, what's the resolution of the DEM and is it combined topobathy or is it clipped just to water areas? 
It is combined topobathy, so it incorporates uh, a lot of sonar data sets as well as some underlying uh, like USGS and, and national elevation data, data set. Um, so it, it was basically just the best ele uh, elevation data that we could get in each area. Um, and as Mark mentioned, this is something we're updating. So there's a lot of new sonar that we collected in the last campaign that's being added. Um, and the uh, underlying data is a 10 meter resolution. Um, and so in most places, we're slightly coarsening that. Um, so usually there's gonna be one or more uh, elevation values in a given triangle, uh, but that depends on the on where in the landscape you are. So some of these cells, it should be similar to that resolution and some of them, uh, it'll be, it'll be coarsened. Online question. There's a question in the chat. Could you discuss the work you have been doing with this model so far, including any long-term morphology modeling? Sure. So. Um, the, the default package of Anuga is a purely hydrodynamic model. So um, we don't have the, the built-in morphodynamic component that uh, we would need to do the, the morphology modeling. Um, but we have been working on, uh, in, a, in a collaboration with our, our colleagues at Caltech and Mike Lamb's group, uh, building a morphodynamic model component that uh, can do all of the sediment transport with these hydrodynamic inputs. Um, and the, the advantage of that is that it's really tailored to fit to the kinds of um, sediment transport uh, field measurements that we took in the campaign. Um, so things like depth profiles of, of concentration gradients um, is, is kind of the main one that we're, we're trying to get the model to accurately model that infection and, and uh, deposition that you can, you can capture from those depth profiles. Um, and so, my applications with the model have primarily concerned uh, with have been concerned with measuring fluxes into different regions of the domain. Um, so the uh, if you look at a map of the Atchafalaya, there are lots of channels that are connected together, um, and there are lots of like wetlands that are you know inundated at different times of the year. Uh, but it's not really easy to understand where the fluxes are heading in those channels. So which channels are active at which times? Uh, which ones are tidally dynamic and which ones maybe just sit statically. So there are lots of channels that were dug for, uh, you know, the purposes of like oil extraction and stuff that are just kind of like antecedent in the, in the topography. Um, and so estimating things like which of these are active, how active, uh, which ones are the most important for the fluxes in the area, and then how long does material tend to stay in each of these places. Um, so answering, answering those questions helps us, you know, learn things about where sediment is likely to go, uh, things like nutrient uh, processing as water is transported through the through the area. Um, so th those have been my my major questions. So this transformation is almost done. Uh, this is uh, a good reflection of the of the size of this bathymetry. So it's actually just reading the the bathymetry data set is all that's happening in this uh you know processing chain um should be done in a few seconds All right, there's another question in the chat. Could you touch on the sediment characteristics you include in the model, given you include sediment transport? Yeah, so the, uh, the sediment transport stuff, um, I, I'm certainly not the go-to uh, person to answer the, question, the questions. Um, that would be Gerard or, or, or Mike Lamb. Um, but some of the attributes that we're, we're trying to fit to are the um, different uh, composition of the sediment in the water. So not just a strict like sand and mud divide, but also uh, things that are flocculating together and maybe mud that's acting like sand. Um, different uh, grain size characteristics. I, 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 I'm certainly not the, uh, the best qualified to, to answer that, but um, yeah. 
Um, and the, the transformations have finished. So uh, sorry about that long data block, but uh, that should be the, the one that takes the longest to run and everything else should be pretty smooth after that. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna plot uh, the output of this, of this uh, function to see what that topography looks like on our you know, discretized domain. Um, I certainly don't remember this cell taking any amount of time. I think I might have gotten a slower collab co connection, which can just kind of happen at random. This is unusual. Um, do you guys have a map of topography? Yes? Okay. So y'all's connections are better than mine. Um, so what you should be seeing uh, on your screens, I suppose, uh, is you have sort of a, there's a break in the color map um, right around the, the intertidal range. Uh, so you should see sort of in greenish colors where you have uh, places that are probably gonna be above the water line most of the time. Um, and then in, in the bluish areas, you should see the, the bathymetry portion. Um, and the, there's a background that's gray to kind of show the, to emphasize where there are the holes in the domain. So where you don't have mesh cells at all, which is also a, a pretty convenient feature that you can just have um, regions internal to your domain that are inactive where you're not spending the, the computational resources. Um, because, uh, you know, if you actually had levied off regions inside of a given model uh, or places where water was completely restricted of going, you could enforce that rigidly in how you design the, the model geometry, um, which is a pretty convenient feature. Um, I have no idea why this cell is stuck. So, I've ran this many times in preparation, and you, you would think that you would run into all the things that could happen. Um, I suppose that I can just keep going since you guys actually have the outputs. Um, so we've added the topography data to our model, uh, and what we're gonna start doing is adding things like boundary conditions and initial conditions. So. Um, you know, the, the model under, under the hood is solving a partial differential equation. And so like solving any PDE, you need to uh, provide what those boundary information uh, look like. Um, so what the, what the boundaries are going to be are enforcing our tidal signal. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull information from one of the NOAA gauges out in the bay uh, using this nice, neatly packaged uh, generate tide gauge function that we imported with the, with the other um, information from our GitHub. Um, and all this is doing is in our settings file, we have the gauge ID for our, our NOAA gauge um, that, we, that we want our boundary information from. And this will go grab that information from, from, the, from the cloud. It will pull it to our um, you know, local machine and download it as a CSV file. And then what we're gonna do is read that gauge data in and return a function that just says, this is the water level as a function of time. So the output of this function is a, uh, basically an interpolation function where if you give it time, it gives you the water level. Um, and Anuga can directly take the function uh, that you know, has, the, has the boundary condition as a function of time, and you can just add that to your boundary and say, I want the water level to be this elevation uh, at whatever time. Um, and I should say that the uh, assumption is that all of our, um, you know, boundaries and, and everything in, in our model are using the same time coordinates, which is just seconds after our initial time. So in our settings file, we have an initial time of uh, March 20th at uh, midnight. So this is, we're trying to align this with the spring Delta X campaign. Um, and then all of our time vectors and, and whatever are converted into seconds after that, that moment. 
Um, so we can plot what that what that function looks like uh, for you know maybe the the two weeks after our initial time, um, and this is what that gauge information looks like uh, if you if you were to inspect it. So you can see you've got tidal signals uh, over this this two week span, um, as well as uh, some some wind information out out near here, um, and so this is what we're using to enforce our our downstream boundary condition. Um, and all we have to do is just add that to our model. Um, so we're, we're just saying, uh, using this Anuga time boundary function, we're just saying that our boundary should use this function of time to define the, the, the water level. Um, and then all of our other uh, boundaries, we're just gonna assume are, are no flux or reflective boundaries. Um, and we're just gonna say for every, uh, Boundary that we have labeled the bay act like this, you know, tidal function. Uh, for all of our other boundaries, just you know, don't don't do anything. Um, and so you might notice if you're you know familiar with modeling that we said that our upstream boundary conditions were uh, no flux or reflective. So where is our inflow coming from? Um, and this is one of the, I would say, main quirks of the way that Anuga handles. Um, you know, the, the computational stuff under the scenes is that the, the best way to make sure that the proper amount of mass is entering our system from upstream is rather than what you would do in, in most other models and say that this is the, you know, the boundary condition is this influx and the, that amount of water is coming in. Um, it's actually more convenient in Anuga to say, uh, we have a location inside of our domain that we're calling an inlet um, and through that inlet, uh, some given amount of mass is going to enter our domain at, at each time step. Um, so you can think of this kind of like a flooding bath drain is how I like to conceive of it. And we basically just surround our boundary of that inlet with, with reflective uh, boundaries. So the water can't exit anywhere, you know, out of the, out of the domain. Uh, it floods into, the, into that inlet and then it pours into the domain because that is the only way for the water to go. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build these inlets around each of our, you know, um, our two upstream inlets. So at, at Calumet and at Morgan City. Um, and then we're also gonna use an inlet to define our outlets along the intercoastal waterway where we're just gonna define a negative discharge. Um, and it's to in total something like 7% of the, of the total discharge will, will exit out of the, the two intercoastal outlets. Um, and so, again, much like our tidal boundary condition, what we're going to do is use this neatly packaged generate hydrograph function that under the scenes will go grab that uh, relevant um, uh, discharge gauge data, uh, pull it in, convert it into the, the format that we want it to be in, and then define a function of time that returns the discharge uh, at each you know, time in seconds after our initial time. Um, and we can, we can again plot the output to look and see what that time varying discharge looks like. Uh, and so you can see here that we have uh, our, our two outlet, our two inlets at uh, Wax Lake and Atchafalaya are providing, you know, something on the order of 5,000 uh, cubic meters per second through time. Um, and then the two intercoastal waterway uh, outlets are these slightly negative uh, lines down at the bottom. Um, and the, as I mentioned in the intro presentation, the Avoca Pass does not have a, uh, a tide gauge that, that can tell you that information. So uh, this is just uh, set to be constant throughout the, throughout the window, which maybe isn't too bad of an uh, assumption. Um, and so these are our uh, discharge inputs. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add these to something uh, called an inlet operator which is just a built-in Anuga function that uh, says there is an inlet at this location that we imported from our settings file. These are, these are hard coded in because they don't, they don't move. Um, and the discharge is equal to whatever that function says the discharge should be. So this is our gauge data uh, that says what the discharge is as a function of time. This is where that inlet should be. And by calling this function, we have just added that inlet to our model. And so if we go to run our model, it knows to add the relevant amount of discharge at each time step. Um, so with that, we have defined all of our boundary conditions and our inputs and outputs. 
Um, so what we, the last few things we need to do are provide a few initial conditions. Um, and so the, the only ones that it really needs are, first, we need to initialize our, our water surface elevation or stage. Um, and so you could potentially initialize this as just zero everywhere. You don't, maybe you assume you don't have any water and you just have a, you know, a flat bed and you, you give your model some time to just kind of spill in and, and fill up all of those regions where water should be. Um, we're going to try something that is a little closer to what uh, you would actually like want to use as an initial, initial condition, which is um, there is water uh, everywhere under some water surface elevation. Uh, but it's not moving yet. So we're just assuming this, there's static water that's kind of sitting everywhere below uh, our initial tidal boundary condition. So um, if we had not set this, then the first thing that would happen when we ran the model is there would kind of just be a flood, uh, like a tsunami from the, from the downstream. Um, and so this prevents that, you know, really dramatic uh, beginning thing. Um, if you have a uh, previous model run and you have these like saved outputs, you can use your initial condition from a previous model run as your new uh, initialization, which would really speed up the amount of time it takes before your model is producing results that are like realistic and informative. Um, but in that case, we're in this case, we're assuming we don't have that knowledge. And so we're, we're doing what's called a cold start in the in the model literature, which is just we don't we don't know where anything's moving yet. We will start with just nothing moving, and once we allow the model to run, uh, that that will uh, improve. And I thought I saw a notification of a question. There is another question in the chat that says, uh, is there any incoming sediment at the Calumet discharge boundary included in the model? So this, this model, the built-in Anuga model, does not have any sediment that is uh, propagating with with this uh, you know, implementation. So the sediment is something that we add to a post-processing model that operates independently of, of the uh, hydrodynamics. So there is no uh, incoming sediment for, for this like implementation. Um, that would be something that you take these hydrodynamic outputs and you add it to, to that uh, sediment transport uh, you know, external model. I also just noticed that my version finally plotted this, which took a really long time. So I'll go ahead and run these other cells really quick. Cool. Um, okay, so the last initial condition that we need to supply is the friction. Um, so our, our our model is not going to do too well if uh, there's there's no friction and it can just flow freely uh, without any resistance. Um, so you've already seen what that uh, friction map looks like. So it's just a classification map. And so what, all we're going to do is for every cell in our domain, we're going to find what the relevant friction class is using this uh, raster to mesh function. Um, and we are going to assign the friction value to that cell uh, using the, the friction uh, coefficients that are in our underlying settings file. Um, and what those settings are, are just some uh, prescribed Manning's coefficients and then uh, vegetation characteristics like the ones we've, we've collected in the field, like density, vegetation height, and diameter. Um, and then we're just going to uh, set the quantity throughout our, our model domain as whatever those relevant values should be. Um, and so I mentioned that we, we added this Baptiste operator, so this is not a uh, built-in um, feature of Anuga. And so the set quantity function here uh, uses the uh, already existing Manning's coefficient to, to supply the Manning's coefficient for those open water classes. Uh, and then this extra step is pulling in this Baptiste operator that, uh, that I defined that we installed earlier from, from the GitHub repository and adds the, L, the other uh, friction characteristics. So uh, this, this line is for Manning's classes and then this line is for vegetated classes. Um, and then once this is done, we have defined all of the inputs that we need in order to run this model. Um, and so briefly, I'll mention that we could have had extra steps here. So we could have potentially had uh, rainfall or wind 
um, which we, we, we are not going to implement here because it slows the model down a bit. But uh, if you, if you wanted to, there are settings for that in the, in the run scripts that you can take a look at. Um, and then the last note that I want to mention before I, before I click run is that so far, what we've done is we've built a, a, a serial model, uh, which means that we're running this on a single processor. We haven't broken the model into chunks at all. Um, and if you wanted to, you know, use the actual model, th this would be pretty computationally inefficient. So it'll probably take quite a while to get results, um, which is true of most, you know, large scale models. Uh, so if we were trying to parallelize this model to get, to get our results faster, um, what that would look like is we would have, uh, in these earlier steps, had a couple extra lines where we basically took, the, took our model and broke it apart into pieces and sent those pieces to, you know, certain processors on our, on our cluster or on our uh, local machine. Um, and the more, you know, pieces you break it up into, generally the faster your model will run. Um, we're just going to run it, you know, all on one processor, so no breaking the model apart. Uh, normally when I run this on, on our cluster, I break it apart into like 380 something uh, pieces. Um, but that's also for the much higher resolution mesh. So there's a lot more elements in that model. Um, so now that I've mentioned all of that, I'm going to go ahead and click this, this next box that runs the model. Um, and the way this works is kind of like just a typical for loop. Um, so for the, the times in, in the, uh, you know, uh, period of time that we want to run our model, it's just going to step forward in time and, and uh, compute what those, what those fluxes uh, should be. Um, and so while this is running, I should mention that there are uh, two relevant time steps to consider in, in a new go. So um, in, in some models, you basically describe, you prescribe a time step in advance that says, I want the model to step forward by, you know, I don't know, 10 seconds each time step. And so it'll compute the velocity at this time, this, this 10 seconds, and then this 10 seconds. Um, so uh, what, we, what we do in, in Anuga instead is that the time step is computed automatically based on the like numerical stability of the, of the flow. Um, and so it's, it's very efficient in the sense that uh, you're, you're always time stepping the maximum amount that your, your velocities will basically allow. Um, and so these are actually like much smaller time steps. They're like on the order of like seconds. Um, and it's computed automatically every time it takes a step and you don't have to do anything to pre-prescribe that. So there's no risk of your model blowing up because you've used too large of a time step or something. Um, and this isn't uh, printing out anything yet, but um, if, your, if yours is running, it should be printing out uh, time stepping statistics on what those time steps look like. And I have a little uh, description of what those time steps look like uh, in the box below. Um, but what, what I should mention is that um, if our actual model time steps are like every like 0.6 seconds or something like that, we can't save the outputs into our like output file every single time step because the model uh, output file would be enormous. And so what we have is we have something called a yield step, which is how frequently we want the model to save that data to the disk. Um, so what I've, what I've done here in this you know, toy example is we're, we're trying to save the outputs every minute. Um, so it'll have you know, however many time steps it takes to get to a minute, and then whatever the flow velocities and the, the water surface elevations are at that time, it'll save that to your disk so that you can import that later and, and read that information. Um, in, the, in the actual application that I use, I normally use a yield step of about 15 minutes, uh, and I run the model for anywhere between, you know, two days to a week or something like that. Um, and so that allows you to import that information without having a, you know, file output that is uh, prohibitively large, even though the actual output is also quite large. Yes. If we were running this in parallel mode, is that yield step the same time step that the parallel blocks will interact like yes. with their boundary conditions? And then in parallel mode, would you have a different variable time step is independently calculated for each block? 
Yeah, so I think, I think that the way that it works is that um, each individual chunk of the model will progress at the speed that, you know, that local block has the stability for. Um, but once it, you know, reaches the end of its time step, it usually needs to communicate with the other, you know, chunks if there's flow that's moving along a channel that's broken into two chunks. Um, so I think it's always limited by the slowest one of those things. So if one uh, of your, like, model chunks has, like, a really fast-moving velocity, that'll take really slow time steps. And I think that will probably dominate the runtime. So everything else will still, you know, be subject to that. But um, I don't know how often that, you know, message passing occurs. So mine is still not uh, printing out time stepping statistics because I have the the uh, the fun collab today. Um, so if yours has, uh, I don't know, per perhaps finished. Oh, there's a question. Yes. Yeah, I, ha I have several questions actually, like to understand the boundary condition actually. So like uh, you say that uh, for Anagar, like we have water level boundary condition and this shirt that's being um, like, I think produced from a gauge data, right? So, and um, generally like in, in, in the models, like we are familiar with, like we have um, ingoing flux and outgoing flux. So here, like the boundary condition, what I understand the upstream boundary condition is a water level. And we have some scattered upstream inlets for the discharge, but we don't have anything uh, in the outgoing side as a boundary condition. So the outgoing side uh, is the tidal boundary condition, okay. which does allow for essentially like flow to exit the domain. So all we're prescribing along the tidal boundary condition is what the like base water surface elevation should be, but we're not saying anything at all about the velocities. Uh, so what'll happen is that the, as the water surface elevation raises at the boundary, um, you know, tides can potentially like flow in and out. But the, the incoming mass that's coming from upstream will just, you know, flow out, you know, superimposed on that tidal signature, basically. Um, okay. So that we're assuming all of the outflow, aside from the, the ones along the intercoastal that we're prescribing, happen uh, at the tidal boundary. So, like, the tail water condition is basically, like, controlled by the tide, you're saying? And uh, one more question, like, why uh, we are, like, Anuga is deriving discharge from gauge data, like instead of using directly the discharge data, because it's, it brings on more uncertainty in the data, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Like the, dis uh, the um, discharge is incorporated in the model in the Anuga, like those were being, uh, is it a direct discharge data is taking from the gauge or just is deriving from the water level data from the gauge? Uh, so I imagine that it's originally taken from water level and converted to discharge, but we're grabbing directly the like discharge data that we're using to do this case. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, and just a general question, like uh, for the model optimization, uh, like looks like you might maybe use scripting for that, but do you have any tool developed for another model optimization? Uh, when you say optimization. A parameter like, parameter optimization yeah. like cal calibration calibration yeah um, so we we have some heuristics for how we apply that um, we don't it's nothing you know rigidly defined so we tried a couple different things um, right now we mostly just follow the heuristics of trying to get the arrival time of the of the tide signature right first and then we kind of get like the relative uh, surfaces of the of the slope correctly um, which is mostly dominated by like the, the open water friction classes that we play around with first. And then, you know, once we get past all of that, then we kind of get into like the, the intertidal zones with the, with the UAV SAR data. Um, but there isn't really a correct way to do all of that yet uh, because, you know, we have like six different input data types that have different observables and different spatial resolutions. Um, so that is something that's just continuously being improved. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And one last question, like, and does um, Anuga has 1D, 2D capability? And also, can we introduce control structure on it, like, as a 2D model? Uh, so it's it, it's fully 2D, and 
and only 2D. So there's no, uh, so I, yeah, like HECRAS, for example, has like the 1D, 2D, uh, you know, compatibility or whatever. This this is fully 2D everywhere. Um, and then you, you said something about adding a uh, control structure. Yeah, is 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 does that have any um, capability so that we can add control structure? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there there are features for uh, different kinds of engineered structures. So you could add things like like river walls, which are like internal no flux boundaries, uh, like levees. Um, you could technically add like culverts um, that I've never played around with because I'm not really in that kind of landscape. But uh, people have applied it to like cities and stuff before too. So yeah. thanks. Sure. Uh, we have a question online. Uh, the question is: I assume this model only tackles land surface flow and channel flow. And there's no subsurface or groundwater flow. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, yeah, that is correct. Which on the time scales that we're concerned with here is probably not too bad of an approximation. Um, if we were modeling like, you know, more multi-week scale, that might might be uh, something we would want. But um, yeah, at the moment it's purely surface flow. So I've gotten a new error on mine. Uh, but if yours were, were working before, I imagine that they are still working. Um, and that's also fine because this was the last cell that I intended to run. Um, and so I have a few uh, cells for uh, examples of how we would analyze the outputs of this model. Uh, but we have not run this model long enough to say anything interesting. So um, if you uh, import your uh, model outputs using this, this next code block, where we basically just load in this, um, what's called an SWW file, uh, which is the uh, nomenclature that Anuga uses for just a, a, a net CDF file. Um, you'll have all of your you know, model parameters, your, your velocities, your conserved quantities through time that you can visualize as a, as a function of time or, or through space. Um, and so if you import these using this, using this function, um, you can you can go ahead and create plots of like the velocity or the or the stage, um, which I, I do have some functions here that I I can't run because this cell up here failed. But you could probably run um, that will show uh, basically just the initial flood wave kind of coming into the the system upstream. So the you should see some some sort of flow velocities up near the inlets where the water is starting to enter the domain. Um, and then I also have an example function for uh, if you have, you know, gauges within your domain at specific sites, all you have to do are provide the, the coordinates of that location and you can pull out um, the, you know, the water surface as a function of time or, or other things about the, do the domain. Uh, because these are not particularly interesting, I'm actually going to uh, go back to the PowerPoint where I have some more interesting outputs to show. You'll have to let me know if it's showing up online. Yeah? Okay, we're good. Um, and so these are just various outputs that you can get from the model that might be observable that you are interested in uh, comparing to the remote sensing data or to, um, you know, something that's like actively uh, interesting about the dynamics of, of the landscape. But um, you can quickly pull out things like flow direction and make these nice maps that show you uh, where the fluxes are from, from channels into the wetlands, uh, which wetlands are hydrodynamically active at different times. Um, and so, so these, these can be quite nice. Uh, I have an animation uh, as a function of time of, of the flow velocity in the, in the domain. Um, and so you can make these, these models, these animations really quick uh, for you know, whatever conserved quantities you might be interested in. So you could look at the water surface as a function of time um, and you'll, you'll notice that uh, you can see these bright colors showing up. I don't know if you can see them, but you see them. You can see these bright colors showing up uh, in these like interior channels inside of the, inside of the wetlands, um, which just really emphasizes that uh, through, through the way that we've uh, built our mesh, you can, you can really capture a lot of dynamics inside of these, these channels that are, that are really quite hard to capture if, you were, if you're doing it uniform uh, everywhere. Um, without sacrificing the, the scale of our model, which is still enclosing basically the entire uh, Atchafalaya watershed. Um, you can also, as I mentioned, uh, inspect the water level output at individual gauges. Uh, so this is one from a simulation a few days ago that just showed for, for some particular gauge uh, at the uh, mouth of the Atchafalaya. 
um, what the first first week of that simulation looked like. And you can see that we're uh, maybe with a slight amount of bias bias, but we're capturing, you know, the relevant dynamics um, at that location. Um, which you can also do, you know, over over longer time scales with more more data sources. So um, this is from a uh, comparison to some of the pre delta X data that used some of our in situ situ gauges and then, you know, each of the other um, like long term monitoring gauges that were around. Um, and at, at the time of this uh, simulation, we didn't have air SWAT, but we did have LIDAR that was simulating air SWAT. Um, and so you can see that see that comparison here, just just trying to tie it back to some of the other other data sets that you've uh, already been exposed to. Um, and then I, I mentioned that we're you know trying to compare to the remote sensing and you can also compare to the kinds of measurements that you can get from INSAR. So um, one of the nice things about this is that, uh, as, as you heard earlier, uh, the uh, UAV SAR water level products are, are relative changes. And what's what's nice about the model is it's very easy to subtract a surface at some time from some surface at a previous time and get what that water level change uh, is in in the in the corresponding model. So for these particular flights with the pre Delta X campaign, um, we we computed what these changes should be, um, and we we also have, uh, it's not you know masked out, but we kind of faded out the areas that UAV SAR can't see. Uh, to emphasize which which places we were we were comparing, um, but with the model you can you know see what all of those gaps look like. So you're not limited to uh, you know only the places that air SWAT can see or only the places UAV SAR can see. You can you can use this to say information in bet in between those about um, you know how they're talking to each other. Um, and so I mentioned that we had some post processing models. Um, so this is one of those. It's it's called Dorado. It is a uh, particle tracking Lagrangian code that um, me and uh, some some collaborators in my group uh, helped develop. Um, and we built this so that we could uh, take this Eulerian perspective of uh, what is happening at each location in the model as a function of time, uh, and use it to say something about the the uh, sort of like material perspective of how. You know, a given thing is being transported through the system. How long does it stay in each location? Um, where, what do these travel paths look like? Um, which is, can be a very helpful uh, shift in perspective. And we've been using this lately to to look at which areas are fed by material from the from the inlet of each of these deltas, and what that magnitude of that uh, nourishment looks like. Um, and this this model is uh, was developed. You know. As also as part of Delta X, uh, just to throw on top of our results and get get some more inf interesting information. Um, but this is actually compatible with with whatever hydrodynamic model you might be using. So this can also be used with with the Delta 3D outputs or or whatever. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to uh, pay homage to the the sediment transport uh, model. So um, I, you know, the the colleagues from Caltech are not here, but Gerard has done a lot of great work. Um, adding sediment transport on top of these solutions, uh, which he's been using to try to compare to the avarice data uh, for, for TSS. So um, this is a output of a, a snapshot in time with his sediment transport model thrown on top of this Anuga simulation. Um, and so you can see, you know, various similarities to the remote sensing data that he, he has done a lot of uh, cool work to analyze. Um, and so that's all that I have. Uh, and I will happily take any questions. Um, like, just just a general question, like about the, you said you use the tide as a boundary condition downstream. So, so Anoga is like only applicable to the coastal zones. Like we can't apply that model. Like there's no option for that, right? Uh, no, you could you could apply it upstream. Um, so there, are, we used what uh, what is called a, a Dirichlet boundary at the at the downstream to to supply our tide as a function of time. Um, but that could be that could take the form of anything. So um, you know, I've, I've built like example models for upstream applications where you maybe uh, know what that what that downstream flux should look like. Um, one thing that I should say is that uh, there. There are a lot of um, numerical discrepancies that come into play in 
uh, slow moving subcritical landscapes like coastal applications that are not a problem upstream. Um, and so one of the things that's that's interesting about subcritical places like like a coastal system is that um, information can propagate upstream. So if you have something that uh, you know is not performing well at your boundary, it can you know propagate into your model and cause things to perform badly upstream. Um, and in uh, upstream landscapes where you don't have that problem, where everything's moving downstream no matter what, uh, you, you actually have a lot more freedom in your application because uh, you don't have to worry about any of those like somewhat expensive uh, settings that are tailored specifically for these like slow moving flat landscapes. Yeah. And can you go back to the particle moving slide? Like yes. here, the red and uh, yellow, what does those colors mean here? Like uh, so the red and yellow were just uh, different uh, injection sites for the for the particles. So we had uh, a certain amount that entered uh, at each time step in at the wax lake uh, apex and at the Atchafalaya apex, and they're colored differently just so that you can more clearly see which one is material coming from each one. So because because we were trying to answer questions about uh, you know what those what those transport pathways look so like. So those are real particle tracking. It's not modeled, right? Uh, no, this is this is model. Yeah. This model. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, question about the origin particles. Um, are they um, passive, like neutral, uh, neutrally buoyant, or can you um, put mass or density to them? Uh, so they they are passive, and um, something that's interesting about these is that uh, if you're if you're at all familiar with the delta RCM model, um, which is a Sort of reduced complexity uh, morphodynamic model that that some people before us uh, have developed. Um, we we basically grabbed the transport functions out of how that model computes fluxes of sand and 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 mud and water, uh, and used it to define the transport of these particles. And uh, one of the features that is interesting about that is that you have parameters where you can effectively change the. Uh, vertical concentration profile of that material, uh, which affects how it kind of propagates downstream. So it doesn't actually have the like fully like 3D, uh, you know, settling or, or um, you know, uh, you know, vertical vorticities or whatever uh, processes you might be interested in in the, in the third dimension, since the model itself doesn't have that. Um, but you can sort of approximate how those other materials might travel by changing this parameter. Um, which is what the underlying model Delta RCM that we that we stole the rule from used to model like sand transport and how that differed from water transport. So um, you can implement certain material properties with these particles, uh, but it is a sort of reduced complexity approach and they are assumed to be neutral. So there's no like actual settling or or any of that. Um, I have a general question for the model with Cartesian coordinate. Uh, generally, the model result near the model boundary is not trusted. Mm -hmm. But like for this n structure grid, uh, do you think that is also an issue? Or for this n structured grid, because you have maybe finer grid point near the boundary, this will not not be an issue. Um. So I, I don't know how the accuracy would compare to to like a Cartesian grid. I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think the go to heuristic of don't trust the model near the boundary is probably still a good idea. Um, so I I intentionally constructed the boundaries to be very far away from the deltas that we were we were interested in to make sure that the we don't have any of those boundary effects. Um, but th that that's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is that at the model boundary, uh, so from my, uh, from my, like, if I may refer it that way, at the southern boundary, at your west boundary, is driven by the water level? The, the sides of the bay, we assume, are static. So uh, we assume that the fluxes are va vaguely aligned with the, uh, the, the tide only comes in from the, from the far downstream boundary. Um, so it's it's coming. We assume it propagates like towards the coast and doesn't come like from all angles. I guess. 
Uh, so how how is the boundary condition applied? Because you have this time series of this gauge position at the boundary condition. So how is that applied in this model? So that is uh, it's it's off screen in this in this animation, but it's uh yeah, it's basically like there's an angled boundary like far down below the two deltas, and the tide only comes from that single boundary. So the two sides we assume. Um, that the material is rough, that the flows are roughly aligned with those two sides, which doesn't seem like too bad of an, uh, an assumption. Um, and then they they just have the the water surface that's prescribed by the tide propagating upstream. Is there a location on the map you can show us where you apply the boundary condition? Um, let me see if I have. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, Nope, that's still. So this this example does show it's just past the uh, continental shelf divide down here. So where the where the elevation starts to drop off, this is where where we define it. So nice and far away from the stuff we care about. Another question. Sort of a follow up on that, but do you so your boundary condition is not necessarily where your tide gauges are located, right? So no, yes. Do you do so? We've had some trouble using that Emirata Pass gauge because it has such a strong riverine signal. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives you some wonky offshore right. behavior. So do you do filters for that, or that's why you use the Eugene? Like you just talked a little bit about how you handle yeah, that? Yeah, so that, that's a very good point. Um, we, we definitely prefer the Eugene when the data is available. Uh, because it doesn't have you know that problem, um, and it, you don't mention uh, wind, but there is also a, a problem with wind from the Emerita Pass. Um, it appears that it's like really uh, sensitive to the direction of the channel that's nearby, so there's a lot of like funneling of the wind. Um, so we we generally pull both of those data sets from from the same gauge just to keep things consistent. So Eugene is preferable. Uh, the problems with Eugene are that it does not have a datum that is tied to NABD 88, which is the common datum that we use all of our other data from. So um, there, there are some correction factors for the fact that our, our vertical datum at that gauge is not well known, and that we have a gauge inside of our domain that we're supplying like all the way down at our boundary. And so there's a time delay. So there's, there's an offset vertically and in time. Um, and so what we do to fix that is that we, uh, you know, we have all of these internal gauges inside of our model. And so we compute the, the cross correlation like lag time between our tidal signal and each of those gauges. Um, and so we offset the, the boundary from, from uh, you know, the time that it's arriving at the gauge in order to uh, make it so that it's you know, arriving at the correct time. So, yes. Um. Two questions uh, regarding the uh, the first one regarding the scalability of the model. Um, um, knowing that the uh, uh, that the model actually treats the time step uh, like dynamically and just you know varies it to ensure the stability. Um, although it depends on the clock speed of your machine, um, but based on your experience. Um, based on the number of cells that you have, and it would be good if you could also provide roughly how much was that, um, how long did it take to, um, uh, to run uh, in a serial mode? And um, how did you try to paralyze it and how much it increased in speed? How many cores did you implement and how much you saw an increase? Um, uh, in, in, in speed, right. so, uh, and, and also another question, um, bearing in mind that you might have uh, some complexities in geometry that might reduce the time step a lot, and in a sense that it would increase the runtime considerably that you don't run it, right. uh, how do you treat that condition? Is it possible to say, no, I don't want my time step to be 
less than this certain limit. Uh, in that case, what if your model does not converge? Does it accept the solution as it is? Or you know, how does that you know, treat that condition? Okay, so um, on your first question of like number of elements and the scalability. So the, the model at full resolution right now as it currently exists has about 1.5 million elements. Um, so it, it is quite large and that is specifically because we're trying to capture these uh, interior wetland channels that uh, prior to having that number of elements, we just did not capture. Like we, you would you know, basically discretize them out and you couldn't see anything. Um, which is, you know, going to be the case with any very coarse model. Um, so we, I don't, I wouldn't try to run the default model in serial mode. Uh, I think it could, but you would need like a pretty impressive amount of RAM. Um, I think that this is something where if you, if you want good hydrodynamic results, you just have to at least have a couple of processors, even, even locally on your machine, if you have parallel capabilities. Uh, breaking it into four or eight pieces is is certainly advantageous. Um, so on the run times, I don't know about serial, but in on our cluster, the the way that we normally run it, I break it up into uh, across eight nodes that have you know some number of processors underneath them. Um, so it's it's something like three hundred and eighty divisions, and it runs in about ten percent of the. Uh, sort of model time. So the, the clock time and the model time is about 10% of that. So if you're trying to model for a week, it takes like 16 hours or something like that, um, which is, you know, not fast, but it's also not too slow for the, for the resolutions that we're getting. Um, and then the second question about the f features that we might not want to capture that are slowing down our model. Um, so you don't have you have a little bit of control over the time stepping. Um, so there are some underlying uh, Anuga configuration settings that you could change for what you ac accept for your CFL, that, that uh, uh, current, current number. Um, usually you don't want that to be above one. So if you're, if you're going really high on that number, then you could have a flow velocity that's so high that a flux could uh, move material past an entire cell uh, before you know your next time step, um, and pretty much in, no matter what model you're using, that's that's likely to cause significant problems. So you you never want uh, material to be moving so fast that it can skip over over grid cells before your next time step. Um, so you can you can change that to allow slightly higher than one. Uh, I have not tried it myself, uh, and I would say that generally if you don't want to include features that are going to slow down the model. Um, you just have to coarsen. Um, but you could also coarsen just like locally. So if there's a, a problem area that you say that, you know, this channel is causing all of my runtime problems and I just, there's no way that I can capture it and get the runtimes that I need. Uh, you could just, you know, manually define uh, a region that says coarsen this location, or you could, uh, in the in the presentation, I showed that you had like an input mask that we we converted into this like polygon information that we used to refine our mesh. You could update that uh, underlying mask to just not have, you know, uh, a positive values in those locations. You could say, you know, this is not a region that I'm interested in. I'm interested in these places. But um, yeah, there there is there is flexibility, but it is you know going to be a problem. Sure. Uh, hey, I, uh, I want to ask at the boundary, currently we didn't impose the velocity field as the boundary. So is there a particular reason? Because at your upper boundary, you did like you impose the discharge velocity. So that means this model can actually take in velocity input at the boundary. So why don't we choose not to include? So it can. Um, the reason that we don't is that we don't know the velocity at the boundary. Um, so we, we have tidal information as a stage through time, but we don't know what amount of flux that corresponds to, like as like a wave into our domain, like the gauge just doesn't provide that kind of information. Um, if we did, then we could, we could potentially provide it there. Um, but by only setting the stage, the other variables are computed based on, you know, just like conservation laws. So by not limiting to, you know, what we 
think the velocity should be, then we're probably getting a more, more appropriate answer. Hey there. Um, what did you say was the best way to access the full model in the future? And is it always through Python? Uh, yes. When you, when you say the, the full model, do you mean the Anuga model or do you mean the, the specific implementation? The Anuga model is on GitHub. Um, so uh, it is, uh, the GitHub is uh, Geoscience Australia. Um, so the, that's just the full, the full impl implementation. You could get it straight from there. Um, and the install scripts and stuff are all, you know, well, well described there. And the developers are also very uh, responsive if you have any questions about, you know, local incompatibilities or any issues getting it working in parallel. Um, and so, yeah, that would be the, that would be the go-to place. Geoscience Australia on GitHub. And I think you mentioned earlier that this is also on, uh, in the Google Drive folder, right? Like your particular model? My particular model is on the, the GitHub that you cloned to get here. So where you clicked the button for opening to Colab, um, in this WLAD model folder, you have all of the run scripts, uh, all of the like underlying bathymetry polygons, um, and everything except for the bathymetry data that we grabbed from that box link that you know, will still, still be available. Um, so if you wanted to run the full scale model and you had like a cluster or something available, uh, that's, that's all there. Thank you. Uh, I might have missed, um, would you please uh, uh, explain, uh, like if you want to define a boundary as a discharge uh, and another, another boundary as water level, uh, does the model go and read from a CSV file from ASCII file, what is the format? Sure. Um, so in actual notes about the just the touch back. So in this uh, script, when we were building our model domain, um, when we pulled in the boundary file, one of the first things we did is we told the model uh, what the names of each of our types of sides are. Um, and so what these are is just the indices of the like boundary segments. So if you went and looked at the mesh um, and you maybe you opened the CSV file for what that boundary is, like the zero with one is like this one and, and then you have one over here and then one over here. Um, so all you have to do is specify which boundary should act like what type of boundary. And then, you know, we only have one bay boundary. So we, we you know, specified things there. And then when you're specifying your um, title condition, which we did down here, um, there, there are all kinds of boundary condition functions inside of Anuga that uh, function in various ways. So we used a time varying Dirichlet boundary here, which says that we know exactly what the stage and potentially the, the velocity should be. Um, and so you can say the bay boundary should act like this. And then this, this uh, line just says, th it assigns that boundary condition to, to that side. Um, but there are other boundaries built in that if you know the discharge, uh, you, you don't technically have to use an inlet, you can use a, a Dirichlet to define a discharge. Um, it's just, more, it's more precise to use an inlet. Um, but there, there are all kinds of uh, different, different options in, in the source code, yeah. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but yes, okay. Is that all the questions? Looks like it. If so, I can I can add uh, just a comment, just to, uh, this is Mark. Go ahead, Go ahead Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so th there were a lot of questions about the uh, uh, sediment transport and uh, what Kyle was showing with the models and everything. Uh, one aspect of Delta X that we uh, still have to, uh, uh, to do uh, to uh, execute and perform is the calibration and validation of uh, the sediment concentrations in the water. So, uh, with the average NG data, 
and also the field data that we acquired will be we have snapshots of the entire landscape and the the amount of sediments in the water so we'll be able to calibrate with that and validate the models that uh, Kyle was uh, just introducing right so right now it, like uh, Kyle put a couple of seeds in the Atrafalaya and the Wax Lake Delta well in the near future hopefully those seeds are based on uh, the actual uh, data from average NG and field data. 